That's all the email said. You have seven days. That was last Friday. There was no return email address, just the one simple line. I had no idea what the hell it meant or what seven days had to do with anything. There was an attachment, but I'm not dumb enough to fall for that kind of virus trap. I deleted it. But it showed up in my inbox again the next morning, Saturday. You have six days. What the hell? Was this someone's very lame idea of a joke? Again with the attachment too. I deleted it. Sunday morning, I awoke fairly early. I was planning a fishing trip with a buddy and we wanted to get an early start. I checked my mail, half expecting to see that same damn message, but it wasn't there, much to my relief. I finished breakfast, grabbed a quick shower, and then gathered my fishing gear and headed out to my truck to find an envelope stuck under my windshield wiper. You have five days, and you should really open the attachment. It will improve your odds. I looked around, but of course there was no one to be seen. This was beginning to piss me off. Just what the hell was going on? Who was doing this and why? And what did however many days were left have to do with anything? And then I froze. How did whoever this was know that I hadn't opened the attachment? I crumpled the damn sheet of paper up along with the envelope and threw them both onto my passenger seat of my truck. I tossed the fishing gear into the bed, then climbed in and headed off to meet my friend. We had a very enjoyable day of fishing, caught a bunch, drank too much beer, got sunburned, and laughed a lot. I completely forgot about the bizarre messages, but that didn't last very long. It was a three-day weekend and Monday morning I was awakened from a deep sleep by a loud banging on my door. I sat up, rubbing my eyes and stretching. What the hell? Who's knocking at my door? I checked the clock. It's six in the freaking morning. On my day off? You've got to be kidding me. I stumbled to the door to open it, planning on giving whoever had the nerve to wake me at such an ungodly hour a serious piece of my mind. But upon yanking the door open, I was greeted by an empty hallway. Nothing. Nobody. Just air. I let out a very terse four-letter expletive in a harsh whisper, not wanting to wake any neighbors who hadn't already been awakened by whatever idiot had been pounding on my door, then started to close it when I noticed another envelope, this one resting on the hallway floor right at my feet. With a slight, uneasy feeling, I stooped and picked it up. You have four days. Burying your head in the sand will not change anything. You should be preparing. I slowly closed the door and retreated to the kitchen where I put coffee on, then sat at the table and reread the note. I had no idea what it meant, but it was starting to rattle me. You should be preparing. For what? Four days until something was going to happen? But no clue, no information, no hint as to what was going to unfold. Then I remembered the attachment. I powered up my laptop and opened my email. I clicked on trash and scrolled down until I found the original message. I reopened it. You have seven days. At the bottom was the attachment. I hesitated. This could very easily be some kind of elaborate scam to get me to open the attachment, at which point a virus would lock up my computer and I would have to pay some outrageous ransom to get it unfrozen. My finger was poised over the mouse the pointer hovering above the attachment. Then a wave of anger flooded through me. Who the hell was this jerk? What right did whoever this dipstick was have to invade my life and try to turn it upside down? The more I thought about it, the angrier I became, and the more convinced that this was just some sick scam. I slammed the laptop shut and slurped my coffee. It was a little past noon that day when my phone rang. I glanced at the screen, but it just said unknown number. I answered. Yeah? It's not a scam. A chill ran up my spine. Who is this? I yelled. You think it's all a scam? It's not. You need to prepare. Your life depends on it. The contest starts in four days. Open the attachment. And the line went dead. I stared at the screen. How did this person know I was thinking it was a scam? 
Now I was really getting rattled. I returned to my computer and opened it again. I found the original email once more. This time I didn't hesitate. I clicked on the attachment. It opened to a greeting. Congratulations. You, along with nine other people you have never met, have been selected to participate in the game. The excitement commences in seven days. The rules are quite simple. Starting seven days from now, ten people who have never met will have the unique challenge of killing each other off until only the winner remains. That's it. No other rules. The day before the game, you'll be given the names, addresses, and a considerable amount of personal information concerning your fellow participants. How you decide to kill the other competitors is up to you. The prize is quite enticing. Your life. Be the last person standing, and you will get to keep it. All others will forfeit theirs. At this point, you are likely wondering what is going on. That is a very common reaction. Many people make the mistake of ignoring this invitation. Those who have are all dead. Others have taken it seriously, but have chosen to either attempt going to the authorities or tried to run. They are likewise all dead. We are watching. We know every move you make. We know your thoughts. We hear your every word. Your participation is not requested. It is required. There are only two ways out of the game. You either walk away as the victor, or you are carried away in the coroner's van. The time to prepare is at hand. Good hunting and good luck. I sat there dumbfounded. Surely this wasn't real. It had to be some kind of sick joke. What person or persons in their right mind would think up something like this? Murder is a game? My phone rang. I looked at the screen. Unknown number. My heart leaped into my throat. Hello? I uttered quietly. Hello, Dan. It is for real. It's not a sick joke. Oh, how the hell did they know what I had just been thinking? Because we're not like most people, Dan. That's how. Damn! They can actually read my mind? Yes, Dan. We can. What are you doing to me? Why are you doing this? Because we find it entertaining, Dan. As I mentioned, we are not like most people. Our otherworldly intelligence comes with a significant drawback. It is very difficult for us living here in your world to find anything of interest. So we devise this little amusement to occupy our downtime, watching such primitive creatures struggle for survival and the lengths they will go in order to cling to their pathetically insignificant lives is tremendously amusing. So might I suggest that you begin preparing in earnest? I can assure you that seven of your future opponents are. The other two will likely be eliminated on the first day. Don't make it three. And the line went dead. It's now 9.21 p.m. Thursday night. The game begins at 6 tomorrow morning. I have maxed out my credit card buying weapons, ammunition, a Kevlar vest, night vision goggles, survival gear, maps, a notebook computer, and anything else I could think of that might help me. As promised, this morning's email contained reams of information about my opponents, six men and three women. I have spent every moment since memorizing every single scrap of data. I have laid out elaborate plans. I have spent hour upon hour and thousands of dollars in ammunition at a firing range learning to shoot and I am scared out of my wits, because I know that at least seven of the others have most likely been doing the same things. I have eight hours and 39 minutes. There are currently six people in space, all officially listed as crew members aboard the ISS. They are Christina Koch, Nick Hag, Alexey Ovchinin, Alexander Skvortsov, Andrew Morgan, Luca Parmitano. Which is why we were so shocked when we received a transmission out of nowhere, one that didn't come from the ISS. 
Of course, it could have come from any of the 4,987 satellites orbiting at various distances around our planet. It could have just bounced off one of them and returned to Earth, making it appear as an alien signal. But it didn't. The transmission came from a satellite in geostationary orbit, as a semi-live feed with minimal delay. What we heard was the voice of a little girl calling out for help in panic. We scrambled around the office at NASA, desperately trying to determine if it was a mistake or some sort of prank. But it, without a doubt, originated from the satellite. Hello? The girl called out on the brink of crying. None of us said a word. We simply stared in awe, each of us hoping someone else would take initiative and respond to the frightened little girl. I'm scared. Please help me, she continued, now sobbing. After what felt like an eternity, I finally grabbed the microphone, unable to bear the increasing tension. Hello? My name is Robert Jones. Who am I speaking to? My name is Amy. Where are you? Why can't I see you? I took a deep breath, half expecting my coworkers to burst out laughing. Their faces were enough proof that they weren't in on the possible joke. We're talking over radio, Amy. That's why you can't see me. How did you find this channel? It's cold. Can you let me out? She asked, ignoring my question. I want to go home. I swallowed hard. She sounded so frightened, so confused. Yet my gut told me something was wrong. Amy, can you tell me where you are? While I waited for a response, one of my co-workers got in contact with a colleague over at Roscosmos, confirming they also received a signal. Confirming they also received the signal. They were frantically trying to get us all to confess to the prank. We shot back with our own accusations, but as they sent us a live feed of their conversation with the girl, we were all baffled to hear that she was speaking in Russian. I don't know where I am. It's dark, and I can't see anything. At that point, the event had attracted a lot of attention around the office. When the head administration found out, we were quickly shut down, and the more senior staff members took over. I paced around the office, not able to shake the feeling that something terrible was about to happen. Thousands of questions whirled around inside my head none of which I could reasonably explain using logic. Rob, do you have a minute? My boss asked as he stepped out from the comms area. He sighed. She asked to speak with you personally. We can't get a single coherent word out of her. I know it's a bit uncomfortable, but we need to figure out what the hell is going on here. I didn't even hesitate. I basically charged past my boss, barged into the room, and only slowed down as I stood in front of the microphone. I grabbed a headset and turned it on, not entirely ready to face what was on the other side. Amy? I asked. Robert, is that you? I nodded for a second, forgetting she couldn't see me. Yes, I'm here. Amy, listen, I need to know how you got to where you are right now. What happened to you? I don't know. My mommy took me to see a doctor. They put me in a machine. They, they, they said they needed to take pictures of my brain because my head always hurts, she cried. Did the doctor tell you what the machine was? Did he call it an MRI? Uh-huh, I, I think that's what the doctor said. I looked around the room, my superiors as dumbfounded as myself, some in heated discussions with the higher-ups. The news were spreading through the company like wildfire, yet no one admitted to knowing what was happening. Amy, can you move around? My boss gestured for my attention. Figure out who he is, he whispered. No, I can't feel my arms or legs, she said. I lost focus for a moment as my boss scribbled down something on a piece of paper and held it up in front of me, a list of questions he wanted me to ask. I hesitated, not because of the questions, but because I didn't feel comfortable knowing the answers. How old are you, Amy? I'm nine. And what's your last name? Keeper. My name is Amy Keeper. The others were coordinating with the Russians at Roscosmos. They were getting the same answers as us, except spoken in Russian. So I asked the only question I could think of. Amy, 
Are you talking to anyone else right now? She didn't respond, so I asked again. Silence. Then another question popped up in my mind. Why me? Amy, why did you want to speak to me? She stopped sulking for a moment. Because I don't want you to die. I looked at my colleagues. They all seemed equally shocked at her statement confirming what I'd just heard. What do you mean? She continued crying, sobbing about wanting to go home. Within a minute without any response, we lost contact. Our colleague from Russia was furious, spouting platitudes that threatening with the death, even as a prank, was going too far. Apparently, they'd gotten a similar message from Amy. After a quick search, we found a single Amy keeper with age and recent hospital visit that matched the person we'd just spoken to. She had passed away from a brain tumor, glioblastoma, six months ago. Her entire treatment history originating from a private hospital, one that has since ceased its operations and closed down. We managed to find the satellite and the little information about it that exists. Apparently, it had been launched in the spring of this year, but while the name was listed, we found no information about who launched it. Artifacts 040919. Last night, I got a call from my coworker. He just received news that one of our Russian counterparts, the radio operator speaking to Amy, had been found dead in his apartment. No autopsy report yet released, but suspected suicide. He'd been warned, just like myself, but the most disturbing thing isn't that she predicted my death long after her own demise. What really terrifies me is that whoever or whatever Amy is, we communicated directly between our offices at NASA and a non-habitable satellite. Meaning the message didn't come from Earth, then bounce off the satellite before reaching our offices. The messages came directly from the satellite. He's still there, staring at my bedroom window. I don't understand what he's doing. His name is Thomas. Thomas is not a nice man. He's a bastard who should have died years ago. But he's never acted like this before. God, what's he doing? Just staring, dead silent. His wife, where the hell is she? Hold on. I see her. She's coming down with that pain. Going to give him a smack, I hope. Oh, she didn't. She's on my lawn now, st staring, staring at my house. They're not talking. They don't look angry. I don't think they even noticed each other. A few minutes later, their daughter Anna came down to stare. Anna is blind. I'm watching the whole family from my living room window. Little Tommy, the evening newspaper kid, was cycling down the street. Now, he took one look at my house and stopped. He's standing on the street right now. All my neighbors are slowly getting out of their houses. Little children, old men, a mother with a stroller. Cars are stopping in the middle of the road so their occupants can press their face against the glass and gawk at my house. Old Miss Aggie, who can't walk, opened her bedroom window's curtains, and I can see her silhouette looming there, hands on the glass. They're not safe there. A murder of crows is gathering on the electric lines. They're pecking at my neighbor's faces, chewing on flesh. Three of them cornered a rat. It sat there while they tore it. The rat's eyes did not move from the windows while it was being eaten. One of them got into the baby stroller. A few seconds later, it came out with something red in its beak. The mother did nothing. It's been hours. They're all still staring. It's getting dark now. They're still standing there, so silent. Like they're dead or something. Are they even breathing? The crows are gone. Even they are scared. So many people now, on their front lawns in the streets, 
just staring at my house, at my bedroom window. I hear things coming from upstairs, something moving, someone talking, breathing, hundreds of people breathing. My eyes have been stuck looking at the ceiling for so long. It, it took hours to write because I can't look away from the ceiling. Only seconds. Just now I heard the upstairs door open. Something is moving around up there. Something with too many legs. I can smell dead bodies now. I know there's a dead body up there. It has to be a dead body. Hundreds of dead bodies all crawling together. Oh God. The plaster in my ceiling cracked. It gave way to a small hole. Something crawled out of it. A long black finger. It twisted and curled. It was beckoning me to come upstairs. Everyone started moving. They, they started walking to my house. I could hear something laughing from my house. I'm going to go upstairs now. I need to see what's up there. Thank you for making it this far. I hope you enjoyed the video. I just wanted to quickly let you know about a couple things I have going on. I have an Instagram where I post more personal things about who I am. It isn't just all creepy stuff. You can find me at Stories After Midnight. I also have a Twitter where I mainly retweet and like things I find interesting. The handle for that is in the description, but it is S underscore A underscore Midnight. I should really find another one because that's hard to say. If you really like what I'm doing, consider joining the Midnighters. That's my growing community where we hang out and have fun and talk about cats. You can find a link to our Discord in the description below. We'd love to see you there. Other than that, it'd make me happier than a cat on a table full of antique glassware if you'd like the video and consider sticking around for more. We'll see you in the next one.